Indeed. Wagner's layout of the theater. Okay. Wagner's lay. All right, all right. Let's see. Let's look at this. Der Fluch des Engelhart by Richard Wagner, conducted by Herr Klaus Immerding and Herr Georg Immerding. I can't believe we've pulled it off. Klaus is gonna be conducting or whatever. Bob. That's awesome. Of course, his brother's doing it with him, but whatever. Jesus, take it from the end. My OCD, no. I don't really have OCD. Oh, you fixed them. Okay. The Curse of Engelhard oh by boy. Richard Wagner. Shit. Act one. Many years ago, in a small German village, there lived a young man named Engelhard. Engelhart was a lowly blacksmith's apprentice. He was fair of face, but by nature gentle and shy. Being orphaned, and having lived with the blacksmith in virtual slavery since his parents died, Engelhart had nothing in the world to claim as his own. Nothing, that is, but an amazing talent. For ten years, the beautiful and much-desired wares that had passed for the blacksmith's own had actually been produced by Engelhart. Hmm. The blacksmith, a greedy and vain man was determined to keep this a secret. He forbade Engelhart to ever work the metal in front of another soul, on pain of death. But the blacksmith's ingratitude went further still. He was so plagued with envy of Engelhart's talents that he treated Engelhart like a lazy and worthless dog. No, oh, page turn. No, oh, wait, nope. The other villagers, assuming that the blacksmith's behavior toward Engelhart must be deserved, followed suit. Now in the same town there lived a rich baron. The baron maintained a patronly and righteous face with the villagers, but it was rumored that he was actually unspeakably cruel and wicked. There was also a young maiden, Hildegunda, who was lovely and good-hearted. Hildegunda was the only one who took pity on Engelhart and was kind to him. Engelhart loved Hildegunda madly, but was too shy and too penniless to even speak of it. In the first act, we learn that Hildegunda's parents, blinded by the prospective fortune, have betrothed her to the Baron. When Hildegunda learns of this, she is terrified and protests that the Baron is reputed to be evil, but her parents brush this off as jealous rumors and demand her obedience. Poor Hildegunda is too good to defy her parents' wishes, and so she reluctantly agrees. The Baron, with great public ceremony, sends Hildegunda a betrothal gift of a silver jewelry box. Hildegunda, overcome by her fear and anger at the betrothal, casts the jewelry box into the fire. She is immediately remorseful and pulls it out, but it is too late. The delicate silver has been madly marred. Hildegunda fears for her life when she sees the damage. She is afraid the blacksmith would report the damage to the Baron, so she approaches Engelhart and begs him to help her. Engelhart thinks of his master's warning, but determines to disregard it for Hildegunda's sake. He melts down the silver and constructs another box even more beautiful than the first. When Hildegunda sees his great artistic skill, she falls in love with him. The two come together in an aria of love, but their bliss is momentary. What about the betrothal? The young couple, knowing the Baron will never relinquish his claim, decide to run away. Act Two. The Baron learns of Hildegunda and Engelhart's disappearance. He is so furious that he hires hunters to track the pair down. Hildegunda and Engelhart are found and arrested. In a public trial, Hildegunda pleads their case in a stirring aria. She tells the townspeople of Engelhart's great skill and his mistreatment by the blacksmith. She tells them Engelhart is good and kind. The blacksmith should be turned out for his evils and Engelhart given the shop. Then she and Engelhart could marry and live in peace with their neighbors. Her parents chose a groom for her, but she begs to be allowed her own choice. It is then the Baron's turn to speak. He declares that he has been terribly injured, a victim of a wayward girl. His marriage claim was first. There can be no other. He implies that if the villagers do not help him make it right, he will remove his aid from the village coffers. Then the Baron turns to Engelhart. 
by the rights of the injured, the Baron announces he is empowered to set a curse. The Baron curses Engelhart with a terrible and ancient malady, that whenever the moon shines in the night, Engelhart will become a marauding wolf. The village is terrified of wolves and has been plagued for many years by a local renegade wolf which has taken the lives of many children. The Baron further declares that because he is merciful, he will still marry Hildegunda, but not until she renounces Engelhard with her own words. Until she does, he will keep her safe from further shame by locking her up in a small room at the top of his house. The villagers naturally side with the Baron. Hildegunda goes to her prison and Engelhard does indeed become a wolf at night. At first, Engelhard is hated and feared by the villagers. They make the sign of the evil eye at him and will not tolerate his presence in town. But soon, rumors start to circulate about Engelhard the wolf. It seems he is always careful not to harm any human being nor any domestic stock. In fact, he even does some good for the villagers. He scares away bandits and he keeps the renegade wolf at bay. No more children are lost to the fangs of the night. Engelhard's kindness shines through even the dire nature of his curse. Hildegunda, meanwhile, still loves Engelhard as much as ever, whatever curse he might be under, and whatever acts that curse might force him to commit. When she hears of Engelhard's successful mastery of the curse, she dedicates herself to him forever. Hildegunda tells the Baron that she will never renounce Engelhard. The Baron's plan, having collapsed before him, having given Engelhard dignity rather than removed it, he flies into a rage. He tells Hildegunda that he will marry her anyway, and on the morrow at that. She will become his wife or her parents' life will be forfeit. Act 3. The final act begins with the wedding feast for Hildegunda and the Baron. Hildegunda has cooperated due to her fear for her parents' lives, but now that the service is over, she is horrified to find herself that Baron's wife and is mourning her final separation from Engelhart. After her poignant opening aria, the Baron approaches her and tries to draw her back to the party. He calls for the entertainment, hoping to cheer her up. In strides a traveling show of minstrels. They wear comic costumes and full face paint and immediately proceed to play and juggle for the crowd. One of them, a mime with a tragic frown painted on his face, seems to want to hover near and amuse the bride. She keeps brushing him off, clearly depressed and tearful, and he does his best to make her laugh. After the amusing antics of the minstrel's first song, the tone changes and the minstrel's music grows dark and theatrical. Indeed. The Baron protests, preferring the comedy, but he's reassured by Hildegunda's father. The minstrels gather in a circle around the frowning minstrel. They whirl around him, and he slowly sinks from sight. The music grows more frantic. Suddenly, the minstrels burst apart like petals, and standing in the center of the room is a wolf. The villagers scream, but Hildegunda cries out that it is Engelhart. The wolf does not attack the crowd. It only lifts its head and begins to howl. The Baron screams at the wolf to stop, and he screams at the villagers to kill the wolf, but they only stare in horror. The Baron pulls his hair and gnashes his teeth. He rises and makes it to the center of the banquet hall, where he falls down in a heap of wedding silk. What emerges from the silk is another wolf. Engelhart has revealed the Baron's terrible secret for all to see. He was the renegade wolf that had terrorized the village. The barren wolf escapes from the hall through the main archway. Engelhart leaps after him. The villagers rally in a cry of horror and fury. One of the men grabs an axe from the wall and entreats the others to follow. They will stalk and kill the murderous wolf. The villagers storm through the archway. Hildegunda follows. The final scene takes place in the woods outside the village. The villagers hunt the two wolves. They follow the wolf tracks, singing of the apparent ferocity of the battle between the two wolves. Hildegunda answers the men's excitement with her own fear for Engelhart's life. The crowd emerges into a clearing. There, the two wolves are engaged in a final deadly embrace. As they watch, Engelhart triumphs and the barren wolf sinks to the ground and dies. Unfortunately, Engelhart is mortally wounded. His curse has been broken by the Baron's death, but it is too late. Hildegunda sings her love to him, while the villagers pronounce him a great hero. 
Engelhart dies and all mourn in a sorrowful final aria. Right. They even got the lore of the... Well, I, I mean, I guess Wagner wrote it along with a little bit of help from Ludwig, so he knew how things worked and put that into the story, too. So, part... Oh, sounds like they're getting ready. Part of the whole thing is making... Making the Black Wolf or Wagner uh, really nervous uh, because it's a story close to his heart. And then there's the the part where these sound waves of a specific frequency uh, bounce off the crystals and uh, push him the rest of the way over into changing form. So now we have things to do. Can we go out here? I could use some fresh air, but I don't have time to go outside. Okay. What's in... Can we go in there? Doesn't look like it. What about over here? Uh, Gabriel's in one of these, I think. Oh no, these are the... Yeah. This place is so freaking beautiful. There's no easy way to get there from inside the auditorium. Yeah. So here is where Von Glauer needs to be. I don't know why I'm Grace going. Nakamura. Yeah, I know. I know who you are by now, Jesus. Oh hello. There's the brothers. We have one hour, people. Her emitting. Her emitting. Her single yes, heart. Mr. Costello. Her emitting. I must again protest about my lack of vocalization in Act 3. I have not a single note until the transformation hour. Now, how many times do we have to go over this? You are disguised as a silent minstrel. I know. But an hour, sung to the audience, off to one side, would be very effective. Hildegard has one. But the audience is not supposed to know it's you until the transformation into a wolf. It's a surprise. You know, surprise. I realize that's the way it's written. I simply disagree with its effectiveness. Your opinion is noted. Ah, it's time to get ready, Georg. You go. I, uh, I want to go on this. Grace is there. We can't really talk to him from here. There's no easy way to get there from inside. Yeah, okay. Alright, so... Was that the second one I was in? No, it was that one. Okay. So I think Gabriel's in here? Yeah, there he is. Someone's put broken glass in my brain. I thought we'd have you back in Rittersburg by now. The Smiths are waiting for you there. It's okay. Just stick me in a room somewhere. Are we ready for the test? I'll check. Could you see about some heat, Gracie? I'm really freezing in here. Are you cold? 
Sure. It's cold. 